Hey guys, Johnny Disc Golf here, back with another off-season interview. This time, I'm joined by the bird himself, Mr. Eagle McMahon. How you doing, buddy? Thanks for having me on. It feels very, you know, 2020, 2021-like <laughs> doing on Zoom, but... You know, we were talking before we even started this interview that mm -hmm. it's kind of easy because, you know, basically you can just roll out of bed and jump on the call with, with Johnny Disc Golf. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And I actually appreciate you have your bed made right there. Most of the interviews so far have like strategically cropped out their their bed. So kudos to you on just like, you know, having a good trend setting morning. I, I'm always an advocate of making my bed. It's the, it's the fresh start to the day. You know, it gets uh, gets me in the right mentality puts everything where it needs to be so that's the that's the way i like to function no i love it i heard it once called like a trend center you know you get one thing done mm -hmm. at the start of the day and you know you're on the right path um let's talk a little bit about the off season though uh we're about a month little under a month away from the season starting um where are you where have you been this off season how's the last you know two and a half months gone for you yeah so my off season started right after the the pro tour finale mm -hmm. and immediately after uh after that went down, uh, I got on the, the phone with Seth at Disc Golf Strong, and I told him, okay, well, I have a lot of time, and I want to get training immediately uh, because I, I started to have an idea of what the 2021 season uh, may look like, and I know it's I know it's going to be busy. Mm -hmm. So I, I know I need to be strong. So pretty much uh, the whole offseason, I've been on a, a – a, a plan with with Seth training anywhere from three to anywhere to five times a week. So I've been uh, I've been logging workouts. Probably wow. have um, about seventy workouts in for the the total of the off season. Um, you know, I was doing a lot of hiking and rucking earlier on, uh, but yeah, really productive off season so far. Not really throwing all that much because I want to give my body a break. Sure. Um, just because I think. You're know, going to be throwing so much uh, during the the season that yeah. you might as well take this opportunity to focus on some other things, strengthen uh, your muscles to uh, be more resilient during the season and have more endurance. No, it's great to hear. I mean, I, I feel like you more than maybe anyone on tour have like a very dedicated mindset towards you know, I guess both your mindset, but also like the physical limitations of your body. Um, how has that relationship between you and Seth grown? Because I feel like, you know, there may have been other people's people like earlier on that disc golf strong game, but you've been like one of his, you know, main people he's working with for a long time now. Yeah. Me and Seth can, we can have a conversation and, you know, usually it goes, Hey, Seth, can I give you a quick call? And it ends up being over an hour just because, <laughs> you know, we listen to a lot of the, the same like fitness gurus, guys on mm -hmm. mindset and other kind of, you know, bio body hacking, uh, uh, ways of thinking. So, you know, our, our partnership is, is very conducive for both of us because we are, we're kind of cut from the same cloth in a lot of ways. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I am a full advocate of what he teaches. And I, I know that, uh, we have a pretty good relationship and I'm, I'm happy to have him in my corner. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned guys like, uh, like Wim Hof in the past, uh, as like, mm -hmm people that you've kind of looked at to like, you know, you know, like uh, build, build beyond what maybe our mental or physical limitations, what we think they may be. Um, are there any, is there any like people that you've kind of come across this off season or like, um, you know, kind of like mottos or mantras that you've had this off season, maybe different than other years? Yeah. I'm always kind of searching for, for the next thing. Uh, you know, I, I don't, from my experience, you have to, keep putting that information in your brain because otherwise you you forget about it you can read this amazing self-help book and of course afterwards you feel like you know you got life figured out everything's going to be good <laughs> but it's that's really not the case uh constantly learning and acquiring new information on mindset um really anything in life you can apply that to uh, any any part uh but you know this year i've 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 looked into some other guys. I've been a big fan of David Goggins, mm, okay. um, who is an ex uh, Navy SEAL and s kind of self-proclaimed toughest man alive. <laughs> uh, but after listening to his audiobook, I can honestly say that he's he's up there. And his kind of whole mentality is 
just we're capable of so much more. We're operating about 40% of what we we know. And, you know, we have 60% le left in the tank a lot of time, even though, uh, you know, we feel like our 40% is 100%. So, you know, just try, trying to kind of push myself and, uh, you know, make less excuses. That's kind of what I've been uh, trying to do this off season. Of course, I say try because it's not, it's not perfect. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm prone to complaining. I'm prone to all the problems everyone else is having, but you know, it's, it's about recognizing that and pulling yourself out of that, uh, that spiral of thinking as fast as possible. No, I mean, yeah, I feel like every time we have a conversation, I end up like leveling up a little bit of like the like <laughs> respect, the athletic respect, because I, I think that there's not a lot of people who are thinking along those lines. And the first thought that came to my head when you said we're only using 40% of our body is like, good Lord, if your distance is only 40% of what you're capable of, that we're all in trouble if that's the case. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the your contract situation. I know you're pretty much shored up now. You've signed, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, a two year extension over the off season. Is that true? Uh, I signed a three year extension oh, three year. Excuse with, me, excuse with, me. with with Disc Mania. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, was there ever any thought? You know, there's probably like three players in the game that I like can't imagine throwing any other discs. You're kind of one of those people. Was there any thought of like switching manufacturers? Did you hear offers for anyone else, or was it you know just from the get go? So I'll, I'll be as honest as I feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. um, starting off, uh, pretty much before USDGC, I was kind of thinking there's, there's not really a chance. I, I want to stay with this mania. There's, uh, I have such a relationship with them and I really do hold that at a high value. Mm -hmm. And as things were kind of progressing after USDGC, of course, you know, Eric Oakley is one of my really my one of my best friends. So is Jeff Corns, and you know it's like uh, you got Discraft pulling at one <laughs> end, Dynamic pulling at the other, and there there definitely was some talks. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, what Discmania could give me, and since I'm so comfortable in the relationships I have established there, mm -hmm. uh, it it was undoubtedly the best place for me to fit to end up because uh, uh, you know. Being one of the crush boys, there's uh, obviously some uh, big business potentials, but mm -hmm. you know, I, I really like being associated with UC. I think he's the Elon Musk of disc golf, and he's <laughs> one of the most understood, misunderstood people out there. Uh, a lot of people see his, uh, see him on social media or hear him, and they're kind of like, "Oh wow, this guy seems kind of scary," but that's just the Finnish culture. <laughs> and uh, once you actually get to know him and see what his uh, visions are, uh, you can honestly have a, a really great respect for him, which uh, which I do. So that hilarious to call him the Elon Musk of disc golf, but I I'm I, I get you what you were talking about, where you're going with that. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about how, like in what way is he misunderstood? Because I know he comes off as like a gruff, this is UC, uh, gruff, like straight to the point, but you're right, that is kind of the finish culture I, most of the finnish people i know are kind of that way in, in what way would you say he's like misunderstood or maybe he doesn't get the credit that you think he deserves yeah a big part of it is the finnish culture and i think that ultimately leads to when he's in an interview or um you know presenting one of his new ideas it can kind of seem cold and a little bit lifeless at times but mm -hmm. that's just what what finnish people are like they're they're straight to the point they're business-like uh, but that doesn't mean there is no emotion involved. Uh, it's really just uh, kind of thinking about what's going to be sustainable long term. And, you know, really, you know, I'm going to be honest, like there's there's a business as aspect to it. And he wants to be profitable because long term, that's going to be a win win for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question. I it's it's funny like there seems to be like this culture in disc golf and not not across the board but like if you're monetizing disc golf there's that's like you know it's kind of like hush hush like you can't really mm -hmm. talk about it um is that something that you face as well because like you're one of the most top tier players right and they're like a lot of times the fans you know they open up their doors to us because they think that we're just like grinding it out on nothing is that something that you experience too because you know you're one of the top yeah it's everyone is kind of under the impression that disc golfers make no money. Mm -hmm. And that is definitely true to a certain extent. But in the last couple of years, just with the pure number of 
fans getting involved and the companies sh s seeing the opportunity to release signature series discs, uh, that gives us a, a really great opportunity. And I would say, you know, I'm just gonna throw a random number out there, 20% uh, or the top 20 players probably have a signature disc and they are able to make more from that signature disc in royalties than what you can actually make from, from winnings. Um, I know, for example, probably myself, Simon, Ricky, Paul, the, the money that we win is, is less than what we take home from our royalties. So that's, that's great because to a certain extent, that allows us not to stress as much when we're at an event. I, I look at it that, you know, they're inter, they're intertwined because when you perform well, you're on Jomez central coast, uh, people are going to see your name and that's going to ultimately be the catalyst for them to go buy some of your products. So playing well has inherent value in other, other aspects of the sport. No, it's interesting. It's an interesting mindset because it kind of ties into like Simon. We're kind of derailing here a little bit, but Simon kind of always has that mindset of like he would rather make a highlight video. And I mean, I know this because I've talked to him specifically. I'm sure other people are the same. He'd rather have a highlight video that gets a lot of views than get first. Like he'll take third with an awesome highlight video rather than mm -hmm. a championship. Is that kind of like, would you say that ties into like that same theory you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's really how many eyes you can grab. And of course, for for all I, I'm still gonna say it, all of the the top players, we're not playing it as a get rich quick scheme. We're sure. we're playing we're playing it for the lifestyle. We enjoy traveling. We enjoy not, you know, going going off the norm, the nine to five. That's the that's the number that's the number one thing we're looking at. But you know, if you can live your dream and also make some dream like money that's that's a that's a that's a, a no-brainer and you gotta you kind of have to take into account um some of that because when you become a professional disc golfer you're essentially becoming a sole proprietor of your own business you have to learn how to promote yourself uh, whether that be through instagram youtube or by other means and that's one one piece of advice do I have to anyone who's watching who is looking to get on the road, you have to look at it from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Every play and performance should be your number one goal, but you know, there's, there's little stems that come off that, that can make that foundation even stronger. I love it. Are there, is there anyone that you see coming up in the game right now that kind of, that is hitting those, check markers you know they're playing well and they're also growing a little bit of a social presence is there anyone that you highlight yeah i have to say ezra ezra i mean even though he's older than me uh he's <laughs> he's he's newer to the sport and i think he really sees the value of uh pushing content on youtube having strong social media presence because that's going to get people engaged and kind of have them understand who he is as a person so when they're watching uh, him playing on top card in an event, they can uh, they can feel like they're emotionally invested in that player. Sure, and honestly, that's something that I've been that that's like slowly been my goal over the past like three years is how can I best serve the players so that fans want to tune in to watch Eagle. They don't want to just watch the final round of some tournament. They want to see Eagle playing, and so mm -hmm. it's just awesome to see like you know, players taking it into their own hands a little bit and like building their own brands. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's cool. It, it's a win-win for the player and the fans involved, involved because it's a mutual appreciation showing that, you know, you're, you're putting out the content to, for the fans. Cause that's, that's entertainment. They're learning things from that. Like when I did, when I did Vlogmas, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't really like to promote that much because I think it's a, uh, I think it's cool just to put out a fun piece of content that you like watching because I know, you know, some advertisements and uh, promotion doesn't bother me sometimes, but if it's on every video, that's mm -hmm. kind of frust frustrating. I think the, the best advertisement is just putting yourself out there and showing that one of the best players in the world is relatable. And, you know, there's, they, they do something that you like doing, um, you know, whether it be like me sharing a Wim Hof method or, 
you know, the anime I like, things mm-hmm. like that is is really cool for the fans to see. And then when you meet the fans, you can talk about something, which I, I really like. Yeah, no question. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I would say your most recent, but I'm not exactly sure, foray into media. Um, I saw a still of you with Brian Geis. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about like what that project is or what the experience was like? I can give a, a little teaser. Sure. Uh, I don't want to completely disclose it because it's going to be, it's a pretty cool project, but Brian Geis, who uh, lives up in Fort Collins, he's working mm-hmm. for Jomez now. He came down and he had this really cool idea to showcase this tradition that me and my dad do every year and uh, really just showcase the the relationship that I have with my dad and and the my hometown, Boulder, Colorado. So it'll be kind of like a, you know, a memento slash a love letter slash uh, just something to be to look back on and, and mm-hmm. really appreciate, you know, my upbringing you know, my, my family and the place I grew up in. So that's, that'll be coming in the next couple months and you should definitely uh, keep an eye out for it. Beautiful. Do you know, um, so do you know where it's, is it, is that a, is that Brian's personal project or is that a Jomez project? Do you, do you have any idea? It's a Jomez project. Yeah. Okay. It was, um, it's fully funded by Jomez. Brian came down in the first day of shooting. He hired, uh, two professional, uh, uh, videographers and a sound guy. So it's, uh, it's going to okay. look pretty good. I think. Nice. I'm super stoked. I saw a still and I haven't talked to Brian in the off season. He's one of my good buddies. And I was just so any sort of like cinematic entrance into disc golf. That's what I'm pushing for. So I just love to see it. Um, Mm -hmm. Quick, let's touch on 2021 season uh, before I get you out of here, because people want to know what, what's this, what's your schedule? Like, I know you're, you're, you're one to maybe skip an event or two throughout the season. Um, Are you hitting them all? If not, which ones are you going to miss out on? The plan is to hit them all right now. And that's going to be national tour, pro tour and majors. And I'm not, I'm not going to really make time for anything else okay. because right there, that's 22 to 23 events. Um, potentially at the, at the end of the year, maybe something looks fun or if the perfect uh, event arises that makes sense, then I might play it. But um I feel as if I need to put my focus on the largest tier events and that's where I'm able to put my focus a few times when I've tried to play kind of a a smaller event, just my preparation, my excitement towards the event doesn't really, isn't really conducive to me playing that event opposed to a a larger scale because I have a, I have a pretty strict process of preparing for an event. I want to, I want to get, at least two or three practice rounds and le- those practice rounds i'm afterwards i'm doing a bunch of uh you know exercises making sure i'm strong doing a you know meditative types things and you know it's it's a lot of work going out to play a, a three round tournament the preparation for that is four to five days or even sometimes even a year prior so like i can't get up as much uh motivation to play let's say a a b tier a tier even a silver series event right now to make it you know worth my time not saying i'm not taking away from those events but that's just me personally if i'm going to focus on something i want to focus on the the big stage sure and 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 i think that we i think that overall we'll probably see more of that take place you know right now it's like you know maybe the top three three guys and in a, in a, the top two women are kind of skipping them and only playing the big ones but i think we're going to see more and more in that the more serious the scene gets um let's talk about the biggest stage worlds utah um a little bit of elevation i think it's like four thousand feet or 4500 feet or something like that um mm-hmm. that's that's kind of the tournament that you know we've seen you win all you know tournaments across the country every region everything but we haven't quite seen you on like that world's final round lead card right in the mix um Mm -hmm. are you where's your mindset going into utah this year i'm obviously excited for it we got uh right after beaver state fling which usually beaver state fling is a big confidence boost for Mm -hmm. me the last two years so uh hopefully things uh you know hopefully the past repeats itself at beaver state fling and i'll have uh some momentum going into uh worlds 
got eight days to practice and I've played the one course, the, the Mulligan slash toads, whatever you want to yeah. call it. <laughs> toads fun and zone. <laughs> yeah. And that's, um, I, I've played, I've played decent there before. I have never played the, the fort. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that event, but in terms of me preparing for it more than any other event, um, that probably will happen you know the the human psychology is to look at the the peak and like i want to get there but mm -hmm. the formula i'm tr always strive to create within disc golf is i want to have a way i look at every event i want to give my best at every single one and if you can do that starting at vegas take it to waco jonesboro and throughout the year you can you can get in a routine and you can figure out okay this works that doesn't work and that's kind of what i did in 2018 and really it's just a snowball effect when you see when you saw ricky winning so much in 2017 when you see paul dominating almost every year it's just because they have this formula that they they go by and they pick up they pick up steam so i'm not necessarily looking at worlds and like okay i don't I just want to win worlds. And I don't care what I do at any other event. You know, that would be great, but I want to give my best effort at every single event. And that's, that's just me. I know Paul's probably gunning for worlds. Ricky's probably gunning for worlds, but I just want to be consistent, put myself in the mix. And if at some point a world title comes from that, then that's great. But that's not going to change my, uh, my mindset moving moving forward. No, I, yeah. I mean, great, great words. Really. I, you know, you get into this weird state where you're all, your focus is on one little thing. And if that little thing doesn't go perfect, it can kind of spiral you. So I, I, that, that, that sentiment really resonates with me. So I appreciate your words. Um, and fingers crossed we can even play worlds. <laughs> you know what? Great point. Great point. And, and actually, before I, that, you you mentioning that actually just brought this to my mind. If if we get into a situation to where international travel in a world where, you know, the international either they can't or they don't feel comfortable coming over, do you feel? As I've asked this to other people. Do you feel that, that kind of like diminishes worlds in that regard? This is a this is a tough question, and it's uh, you know I. This is a question I need probably more time to think about, but sure. I'll give I'll give you an answer. It's I it, it definitely takes away from the overall prestige because you know if we would have had worlds last year, it would have just been everyone from the U.S. and Thomas Gilbert, um, <laughs> and that you know that's the that's the North American Championship right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So. Usually Monabu from Japan comes over, people from Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Norway, the whole mm -hmm. list, even South Korea, even yeah. like that always surprises me when I see people, you know, carrying the South Korean flag in uh, at Worlds, but that would take away from it. And it's kind of hard to say whether if you can't have that, that international presence to where if you should still run it or not. I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of torn between yes and no on that question. I totally feel you and and one like I was talking to Paige a little bit about this. I feel like that's even further in that direction in the FPO field. Because, mm -hmm. you know, let's be honest, in MPO like, you know, Seppo's in that in that range where he's a, you know, legitimate contender, Monabu's a great player, but like odds are the league card is not going to have any European representation just from the odds, I guess, Simon, you know, obviously, but he's, Simon or, I mean, Albert, Albert was actually, at, Albert Tom, on, great point. He was on two of the, the three major lead card of mm -hmm. the majors in 20, 2019. But then you look at the women's field, the FPO field, and there's, you know, legitimately three out of the top six players in the world mm -hmm. are European. So, you know, the question almost is a little bit more, not relevant, but a little bit more pressing in that FPO division. And, and, you know, the general sentiment I'm getting is like, yes, it'll lessen the prestige, but if it's running, I'm going to go and I'm going to try and win. Is that kind of how you feel? I guess. I mean, when it comes down to, when it comes down to that, it's If you put a major title on anything, then the players are probably going to go. 
even though they might not be that happy about it. Yeah. So um, if there, if it happens without international presence, everyone's still going to go and still mm-hmm. going to try to win. I don't think it's going to take away that much for, from the champion, mm-hmm. but you know, it, it, it will be unfortunate for the, the Europeans who aren't able to attend. No, absolutely. And uh, you know, to, to attempt at not ending it at a down note, um, I'm going to give you, Eagle, a chance to say, you know, you have anything you want to say to the fans? You know, there's so many people out there that support uh, Mr. Eagle McMahon. Anything you want to say? Well, one, thank you for the support. And two, I'm working on making something pretty fun happening for my YouTube channel this year. Uh, I'll be working with uh, someone else. I'm not going to disclose too much information. It may start at the All-Star event or it may start at Waco, but uh, hopefully I can figure out a, a different medium of, you know, showing uh, showing some fun stuff out on tour that uh, the fans might want to see. Ooh, I like that. I can't wait to see it. Um, you know, please send me a link whenever it comes out. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, Eagle, that is all I've got for this interview. Folks at home, if you would like interviews of all things disc golf, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel.